This is Duke University. Welcome, everyone. I'm Deborah Jensen, director of the Franklin Humanities Institute, and we are thrilled to have Jeffrey Harpham here this evening. Um, Jeffrey Harpham is the former president of the National Humanities Center and is now at the Keenan Institute. And Karina Stan, who is a new uh, professor at Duke, will be doing his introduction. So I won't introduce him, but I will mention that this event is co-sponsored by the Keenan Institute for Ethics. Uh, and that it is in our Academic Futurology Humanities Futures series. And in Academic Futurology, we try to think about uh, academia and its possibilities, its paths, its paradoxes, and its potential. And I think that tonight's talk is, is going to be really instructive um, in that regard. So I am going to start out by introducing Karina, uh, uh, and we're actually thinking that it would be a wonderful thing to have new assistant professors at Duke routinely uh, come and help us with introducing events so that we all get to know them without them being on the spot for their own talk, although we hope that we will have Karina to uh, do a talk with us sometime soon. Um, Karina Stan got her BA from the Sorbonne, her MA from the Université de Paris Diderot, and her PhD uh, in literature from Duke University in 2010. And she has reappeared at Duke like a rare comet as an assistant professor in English. I can't even tell you how the planets have to align for someone to return uh, to their home university as an assistant professor. She taught comparative literature as an assistant professor at Leiden University College, The Hague, Netherlands, for three years, where she was also in charge of the Brill Nijoff Writing Institute. Her academic interests and research are in the areas of 20th and 21st century comparative literature, British, French, and German, the intersection of literature and moral philosophy, which connects very well to our speaker and his respondent this evening, critical theory and the sociology of intellectuals. She has published quite widely, and her article titles have a wonderfully poetic qu quality in which ed educational challenge finds foundation, like listening with mental doors ajar, interpassive learning, political correctness, rethinking the lecture today in Empedocles, European Journal for the Philosophy of Communication. So I'm gonna start reading these, these articles. And I wish that I were a fly on the wall in her current course on political drama, of which I'll read you the opening of the abstract. Power comes only with the death of politics, one of Wole Soyinka's characters reflects in a play of giants. And that is where a certain kind of theater begins, one might add, in this course, we will read and discuss some fascinating 20th century plays that engage with political themes, portraying not so much those famous historical individuals whose grand visions shaped the course of events, although a Hitler and some thinly disguised African leaders do grace the stage, but common people who played a role or hoped they did in events ranging from the French Revolution to the war in Afghanistan. Our interest in shedding light through the medium of drama on phenomena such as the dictatorship in Chile and Romania, or the psychological intricacies of one's obsession with power, will be on equal footing with an examination of the plays in their generic specificity. So, and after uh, Karina introduces our speaker, then Michael Gillespie will be doing the response. Michael Gillespie is an American philosopher and professor of political science and philosophy here at Duke. His areas of interest are political philosophy, continental philosophy, history of philosophy, and the origins of modernity. He has published on the relationship between theology and philosophy, medieval theology, liberalism, and a number of philosophers, including Nietzsche, Hegel, Heidegger, and Kant. After his last works on the relationship between theology and philosophy, 
In a survey titled Political Theory Today, carried out by the California Polytechnic State University, Gillespie was listed among the top 20 most influential philosophers of the next 20 years. And I like to think that between the person who is introducing Jeffrey Harpham and the person who will be following the talk with a response, that we see that education spans world literatures, the political, uh, the aesthetic, the social, and history uh, from ancient religions uh, and uh, to, to the current moment. So, Karina, welcome. Good evening. I really appreciate the opportunity to introduce um, Jeffrey Harfam. It's a great honor for me. Thank you for um, introducing me as well. Um, but probably most of you will agree that Jeffrey Harpham does not need an introduction. Many of you have been um, very likely he, uh, recipients of his gracious hospitality at the National Humanities Center, which he directed until last year. Uh, many of you are familiar with his interventions in literary criticism and ethics, and I will simply list the titles of his books um, on the grotesque uh, from 82, the Aesthetic Imperative in Culture and Criticism, Getting It Right from 92, um, the book on Conrad in 96, Shadows of Ethics, Criticism and the Just Society, Language Alone, the Critical Fetish of Modernity, and the Character of Criticism. Finally, in, 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2011, he published The Humanities and the Dream of America. Or perhaps if you teach literature, you have kept or are still keeping close at hand like me one of the many editions of the Indispensable Glossary of Literary Terms, which he co-authored with um, M.H. Abrams. Now, if this impressive list of scholarly accomplishments is hardly necessary in this context, I have nonetheless read it to you because I would like to look at it through a lens offered by one of Jeffrey Harpon's books, The Character of Criticism. Against loud proclamations of the death of the author and of ways of understanding criticism at this detached scholarly exercise conducted in difficult jargon, this book offers a compelling account of criticism as a richly expressive discourse. It includes, indeed, textual commentary, historical research, and theoretical reflection, but, most importantly, and I quote, it is also a human practice of reflection and meditation that enlists every intellectual, affective, and experiential resource that a person has. A book of criticism gives voice to a distinctive way of being in the world that I will call character, Jeffrey Harpin writes. In light of this remark, the bold question that emerges from the titles of books I have enumerated is, what unique way of being in the world can be inferred from them? Character thus understood is not a matter of conscious performance. Rather, it is disclosed in the choice of subject, what sort of thing the author spends his or her time thinking about, no doubt a matter of elective affinities, in the angle of vision or take on the subject and the way one deploys method. Now, of course, this kind of analysis requires a temporality and space incompatible with what I have this evening. The question is, however, so tempting that it is worth at least beginning to consider. Jeffrey Harfam's choice of subject is most obviously ethics. But his titles offer intriguing insight into the unusual angles of vision one can adopt. The grotesque and the ascetic, mastery and shadows, imperative and fetish, right and dream. These are some words that I've just selected from the titles. One could go on with these juxtapositions, but what I wish to highlight is the practice of an ethical discourse in which encounters with other minds from Grunewald, Konrad, and Nietzsche to Nussbaum, Rizek, and Said, serve not as pretexts to put forward ultimately admirable moral views and ideals, but to tread with lucidity in the very complicated sphere of human experience, endlessly fraught with contradictions in which a scintillating intelligence can coexist with naivety, iron discipline with weakness, deep admiration for someone with disbelief at their political commitments. To my mind, Jeffrey Harfam's criticism is the most exquisite example of tact, and I do not mean by it a politeness that turns its head away from unpleasant or disconcerting aspects of human life, 
from the trivial ways of human failure, pretending that they are not there. Rather, I see tact here, as Roland Barthes defined delicatesse, as a capacity to make and articulate fine distinctions, or as Stanley Covell paraphrased tact, as a tremendous amount of force applied with tremendous precision, illustrating the idea by, I mean, Stanley Covell illustrated this idea of tact by invoking the activity of the surgeon, the touch of a skilled pianist, the parent raising children, or the jeweler cutting a diamond. To give you just an example from the character of criticism, I have never read a book in which lengthy, generous articulations of someone's intellectual merit coexist in equal measure with long passages of acute disagreement. On one hand, for example, Jeffrey Harpon writes of Martha Nussbaum's undifferentiated use of such terms as passion or emotions and emotional activity, I quote, as though these terms designated simple holes with a positive moral value and were incompatible by definition with hatred, contempt, envy, lust, and aggressivity. The chapter, however, ends with the acknowledgement of the magnitude of the political task that Nussbaum has imposed on herself. I quote, if intellectuals feel that risking scorn by raising large and intractable issues is a bad thing, then perhaps we should reassess what we are doing and why we are doing it. Similarly, the brilliant chapter on Slavoj Žižek opens up the critique to broader questions about the situation of the humanities in the West today. And if you only read these texts, you might think that these are perfunctory gestures at the end of very, very critical um, chapters. But in fact, if you continue to read Jeffrey Harpon's work, you will see that they are anything but perfunctory. perfunctory. In fact, these are questions that are at the center of his preoccupations. Um, these are also questions that have concerned him as a director and president of the National Humanities Center, a position he has held for 12 years, during which he became not only an advocate for the humanities, but also a historian of the humanities. As the book published in 2011, The Humanities and the Dream of America testifies. Now, President Broadhead's summary of Jeffrey Harfon's activity as the director of the center, both putting a roof of the, over the humanities, but also building a foundation for them, strikes me as beautifully precise. In a difficult fundraising climate for the humanities, he raised the endowment from $34 million to nearly $80 million, ensuring the future of the institution through multidimensional, multidisciplinary projects focused on the ways that empirical science was affecting our understanding of the human and on the contribution of the humanities to our understanding of human rights, he placed the humanities in conversation with other disciplines, including cognitive science, primatology, computer science, law, and evolutionary biology. Duke faculty were involved in all this work as they also became members, together with scholars from UMC and NC State, of the Triangle Digital Humanities <coughs> Network, which Jeffrey Harfum founded. He also served as an ambassador for the humanities, lecturing in Europe, China, Australia, Turkey, and Africa. He paid particular attention to China, creating a China Scholars Program, which brings scholars from universities in China and Taiwan to the National Humanities Center each year. Now, please let me close with a personal memory. A few years ago, when I was teaching at Leiden University College, The Hague, Jeffrey Harpom lectured on the humanities as a discipline. The event was by far the best attended lecture during my time there, and it had a unique ending. The students were so enthusiastic that at the end, they surrounded the lectern, and a couple of them, more outspoken, invited him to dinner. They didn't know, they said, that he could not accept, but even anticipating refusal, extending their hospitality in this spontaneous way, was to them the only possible reaction to his inspiring lecture. Since this afternoon, we are also in for an intellectual treat of the first order. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Harpen. What a wonderful introduction. The first time I met Corinna, which was now seven, eight, how long many, how many years ago? However many it was, the first time I met her, I remember saying to myself, that woman's going to go very far. What I didn't know was that she'd be going very far right here. <laughs> but that's the way it has worked out. During my years at the National Humanities Center, uh, as Corinna mentioned, I was often asked to pontificate about the humanities. Uh, at first, I found this to be a pretty uh, tedious task because uh, 
the discourse surrounding the humanities and the liberal arts uh, concept in which it was embedded had become so resentful and defensive and complaining and whining and righteous uh, that it didn't seem like um, it was going to be that rewarding to try to add a couple of pebbles to that heap already. People were always arguing that the humanities were in some state of st steep and irreversible decline with no Captain Sully around to land the ship, much less to make it fly again. <clears throat> but the more I reflected on the subject, the more I came to feel that the, the entire situation might look different if we approached it, not from the standpoint of the, of the present with their depressing trend lines, but rather from the standpoint of the past. And as I learned more about the educational system in other countries, I began to be more aware of the distinctness, even the uniqueness of the American system. There seemed to me a positive connection between American national self-understanding, if there could be said to be such a thing, and the way that we educated people. This recognition grew into a book that I published about six years ago called The Humanities and the Dream of America, in which I argued that the humanities as an institutional academic category were an American invention. And that was as far as I had gotten then. But a few years ago, a chance conversation crystallized another stream of thought that had been percolating through my brain without ever having reached uh, articulation. Uh, after a talk I gave at Washington University in St. Louis, I was approached by a, a number of people, but a, a, an elderly man, very well-dressed, very cheerful aspect, kind of shouldered his way to the front, and he said, uh, I'd like to tell you my story. Uh, which is not the way most people come up and approach a speaker after, uh, after a talk, but he seemed uh, uh, so pleased with himself that I couldn't deny him the opportunity. So I said, well, let's, uh, let's hear your story. And he said, about 50 years ago, which would make it in the early 1960s, I arrived in this country from Cuba on a boat. I was one of the survivors of this trip. Uh, when I washed up on shore, I had nothing, no clothes, no English, no money, no papers, no relatives, no friends. <clears throat> After a couple of years kicking around in uh, uh, Tampa, I think, uh, he said, I wanted to improve my situation, so I went out and got a GED. My English was a little better at that point. And from there, I went to a community college because I thought I might want to pursue something I had little idea what. And the community college made me take an academic course and it involved literature. In fact, it involved Shakespeare. And at this, he was completely defeated. He said, I had no understanding of Shakespeare. So I just sat at the back of the room, and I kept my head down, and I tried to look studious and escape detection. But one day, the teacher came over to me and said, Mr. Ramirez, what do you think? And as he told me, he said, I looked up at him helplessly. I had no thoughts. I didn't think anything. I had no comprehension of the words on the page. Shakespeare was not the language that I was, I was capable of deciphering. And I looked at him for a long, helpless moment, and eventually he moved on to torment somebody else, and the rest is a blur to me. But I've always remembered that exchange, he said, because it was the first time in my life anybody had ever asked me that question. Now, <clears throat> he said, that's my story, and he smiled and walked away. And I dealt with the other people, and I put his business card in my pocket. But later on, uh, when I was back at my hotel that evening, I took his card out, and I saw that he must have overcome his shyness and paralysis at some point, because he was now an emeritus professor of comparative literature, <laughs> a very good university. And I thought, well, that's just amazing. But I didn't understand the depth of the story. And so, stupidly, I threw his card away, thinking, I'll never see this guy again. But a couple of weeks later, as I began to return again at the end of the story, I saw that an entire national program had crystallized in this one little story. You have a kind of welcome hospitality to the orphans of the world storms, you know, give me your poor, your wretched refuse. In fact, he cited that phrase himself from the Statue of Liberty. You have access to education, secondary education, or if you don't have a high school, you can get a GED. Then you have access to higher education in the form of a community college that's designed to help you if you aren't ready for a four-year college right away. And then the community college, this is 1960, had an academic program. It wasn't until the 1970s that community colleges began to be primarily vocational, 
uh, earlier on, uh, community colleges were academic institutions designed to prepare you for a four-year college. And then within the academic program, there was a humanities component, a literature requirement. Shakespeare, the highest pinnacle that world literature has reached, uh, was offered to you, Mr. Ramirez. And then the cherry on top of the whipped cream, your opinion is directly solicited. Your opinion is what's important. We want to know about your opinion. Um, <clears throat> all these levels and premises and, 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 and assumptions were built into a program that was quite deliberately constructed at the end of the Second World War of universal, liberal, general education that was without any parallel in the rest of the world. They were formulated explicitly as national policy at this time uh, in the Truman Report, a six-volume report that had the effect of well, just transforming the educational system of the country just at the time that the GI Bill was affording hundreds and hundreds of thousands of GIs the opportunity to go to college free. The post-war premise was that education was the path to success and the guarantor of equal access to opportunity. It was the instrument by which the nation's original promise of equality might begin to be redeemed. And the 30 years or so following the war, when this policy was in place, are now universally recalled as the golden age in higher education. By an equally universal consensus, we are now no longer in the golden age of higher education. I think when the Beatles broke up and the Bee Gees arrived, there's no point in pretending that we're still in paradise. And so now, so thoroughly bronzed are we, that the golden age itself is sometimes seen as a kind of Cold War mystification when the United States advanced itself in a very triumphant, uh, triumphant spirit as the savior of humanity. This was not a moment when respect for the other or cultural diversity were celebrated. But in its time and in its way, the program of universal, liberal, and general education that was devised at the conclusion of the war was a radical democratic event. I don't want to resuscitate the golden age, even though we do seem to be slipping into a new Cold War. But I think it's very much worth trying to recapture the, the, the deep currents of commitment and aspiration that informed that philosophy of education so that we might consider what aspects, if any of it, might still be viable or applicable today. If we can show how that program had established that anchorage in American core values, then we could understand, I think, what it was trying to achieve and we could even challenge any new system that came along to establish a similarly deep anchorage in, the, in those values. Now, to get at the relationship between the, the, the vast and various system of education in this country, so vast and various it hardly seems like a system at all, uh, and core American principles, I want you to take a look at the first page that you have with the short conversation between Henry Barrow and Lancelot Andrews. Henry Barrow is a leading member of the separatists the radical Protestant group that insisted on a complete break with the Church of England. Lancelot Barrows, the man on the right, is a powerful cleric. He would eventually become Bishop of Winchester. Uh, he was the leading figure behind the translation of the King James Bible. It's been pretty well determined that he wrote, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And he also wrote, and the Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. He was a great stylist, but a very cruel man as this uh, conversation shows. His goal, Andrews's goal, in visiting uh, Mr. Barrow in the, uh, uh, the, the prison called The Fleet, uh, there are great names for prisons. There was another one called The Clink in, in London at this time, but Barrows was imprisoned in the, the Fleet. His goal was to elicit from Barrows, through cunning means, some culpable utterance that would justify the punishment that Barrow was in any event going to receive. Uh, and so he approached his project indirectly by way of a discussion of the general principles of interpretation. Andrew says, all men, can, the, the, the subject is the interpretation of the Bible. Andrew says, all men cannot judge. Who then shall judge of the word? And Barrow says, the word. <laughs> and let everyone that judgeth take heed that he judgeth aright thereby. Andrews, I mean, you can hear the... the, the the, the key turning of the lock to that prison, the savoreth of a private spirit. According to Andrews, the country could not tolerate a libertine cult devoted to you know, everybody interpreting the Bible for themselves. In this conversation might be said to lie the origins of the United States. 
The idea that everyone could judge the word themselves was a key principle of the Reformation, one that the separatists insisted on. They repudiated the church and the council of learned divines and all these people that sought to stand between every individual and the word of God and charged that in England the Reformation was a very incomplete process. Now, Andrews won this dispute in the sense that Barrows was hung several years later. And not long thereafter, uh, the separatists left on the Mayflower to be followed shortly thereafter by the Puritans. Once in the New World, these groups established a practice of universal literacy insofar as they could in these embattled little wilderness outposts. Every village, at least in New England, had a public school, and in time, Harvard College was founded to educate ministers. Theocratic Puritan culture didn't outlast the 17th century, but they left a number of echoes and residues, one of which was, <coughs> excuse me, one of which was the settled conviction that each individual is entitled to his or her matter, uh, opinion on matters of fundamental importance, and that the most fundamental, the most important matters involved textual interpretation. Uh, the core of my argument in the book that I have just finished uh, which is incidentally called, What Do You Think, Mr. Ramirez, An American Philosophy of Education? The core of my argument concerns then the history of opinion in the United States. The United States as a country could be said to begin with the Declaration of Independence, which itself begins with an allusion to separatism in the phrase, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled the colonies. The Declaration also links the principle of separation to a decent respect to the opinions of mankind, which, as Jefferson writes, requires the revolutionists to declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So you can see these terms, separation and opinion, are quite intimately linked in the Declaration. And the very phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident, implicitly elevates opinions, we holding, to the same status as self-evident truths, and in fact founds the revolution on that equivalence. Now, opinion might seem kind of a piffling thing on which to found a nation, but historians, philosophers, political leaders, all manner of people have recognized in America an historically singular uh, instance of a country founded on the right of each person to his or her opinion. Popular sovereignty, uh, as the historian Edmund Morgan has written, is sustained only by opinions, a, a concept to which he votes a, a, a several highly influential and original chapters. Perhaps every political leader has had intuitions like those of Abraham Lincoln, who says, our government rests in public opinion. Who can change public opinion can change the government. And commentators without number have come to the same conclusion as Alexis de Tocqueville, who called opinion in the new American society the mistress of all the world. As de Tocqueville understood, public opinion was a dangerous as well as a powerful mistress for she lent her support to the twin tendencies to anarchy and tyranny that he saw uh, already on display in American society. But even while witnessing and imagining the very worst possibilities that might flow from the reign of unregulated public opinion, de Tocqueville also recognized that establishing the rights to opinion was one of the great accomplishments of the revolution. It's the, the, it, uh, the right to opinion is the right that underwrites other rights. As Hannah Arendt was later to say, it's the right to have rights. Opinion is the constituent unit of debate. And if you look at the most recent New Yorker, Jill Lepore, has an article on the status of debate. She's talking about presidential debates, but then she raises the subject of debate more generally. And she says, debate is the key to every institution that makes civic life possible. Without debate, there can be no self-government. And without opinion, there can be no debate. The most conspicuous triumphs of opinion have come in the area that most directly descends from the reading of the Bible, uh, the interpretation of the Constitution, where the stakes of opinion and, and judgment are the highest. As many commentators have noted, the Constitution is a secular and civil equivalent to the Bible. It's a text whose supreme, uh, supreme importance, whose authority cannot be questioned, whose form is fixed, and whose meaning is very unclear. There is, as we all know, a school of thought that says that the text uh, Constitution is a plain and pristine statement that requires no cognitive activity more complex than, as John Roberts put it in his 2005 confirmation hearing, calling balls and strikes as each case whizzes by. Conservative thinkers, in fact, often make a point of 
of rejecting the very notion of interpretation, saying that the document virtually interprets itself, and that if we can ascertain the original public meaning or the textual meaning of the words, or however they want to put it, we should have no need for interpretive innovations proposed by interested parties or their ingenious lawyers. But the Supreme Court itself refers to its decisions as opinions. And the framers well understood that the document they produced would require continuous debate as people tried to figure out how their phrases could be applied to a future world. This is why they took such great pains to frame the document in the simplest terms possible so that anyone in any era could understand it. Indeed, almost immediately after ratification, comments appeared stating that this very simplicity, that this pellucid clarity, even in, or especially in the Bill of Rights, created mysteries about the intentions behind the words and that one of the main tasks of the judiciary would be to settle disputes about those intentions. Liberals, by contrast, often defend a living document principle that the Constitution has to be interpreted in light of previous court decisions and contemporary standards. And they oppose their views to conservative insistence that we need only return to the original intent behind the document. But I want to argue that both arguments are originalist and that both ultimately refer for their warrant to some founding intention behind the text. Conservatives claim that the only legitimate warrant for interpretive conclusions lies in the past, in the founding moment. And the understanding of the document that's held by the framers or the ratifiers or the people generally or whoever they want to designate, but the orientation is towards the past. But so do the living document people who hold that the framers intended that we should interpret the words of the text in our time and according to our own lights. When it comes to interpreting the Constitution, we're all originalists. Originalism, in short, is as powerful a principle in this country as separatism. Indeed, you could argue, and I would argue, that originalism arose to alleviate the anxieties created by separation, <laughs> by enabling people who had detached themselves from authority to ground themselves in something primary and, 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 and fundamental. But originalism is not just a substitute for a mis misplaced or a lost principle of authority it can also be a force for progressive change. And as an example of this premise, I want to focus for a minute or two on one of the most innovative and effective readers of the Constitution in our nation's history, and that would be Frederick Douglass. As you know, Douglass was born a slave in Maryland, and he escaped as a young man up north. There he met abolitionists who refused to obey the Constitution in any respect. They wouldn't vote. They wouldn't run for office. Anything that the Constitution declared legal, they wouldn't do because they regarded the Constitution as a slave document. <clears throat> At first, Douglas agreed, but he soon realized that this argument placed him on the wrong side of the law. That's a weak position to be in. In a stunning reversal, stunning particularly to his older, wiser, more established white friends, uh, Douglas abandoned his uh, abolitionist allies and began to argue the opposite case, that despite the fact that many of the framers, like 12 of the first 15 American presidents, owned slaves, the Constitution was intended to be an anti-slavery document, relying on a broader and less individualistic understanding of intention. Douglas pointed to the general democratic character of the nation, the magnanimity of its people, the founding promise of equality in the Declaration, all as signs that the Constitution did not envision, much less intend to legitimate a nation in which slaves were held. As the Civil War approached, Douglas hardened and narrowed this insistence on the literal and specific meaning of the document's words, and he even said that he was for strict construction of the words in the Constitution. Even then, this was a kind of a reactionary touchstone, strict construction of the Constitution. And Douglas said, I myself am for strict construction of the words in the Constitution, the words on the paper. These words, he pointed out, did not include slave, slaveholding, slavery, anything to do with slavery. All in all, he said, if the Constitution were, quote, interpreted as it ought to be interpreted, it would be seen as a glorious liberty document. Now, not through his agency alone, to be sure, but in due time, his arguments about the essential meaning of the Constitution prevailed, and in fact, document was amended after the Civil War in order to make this perfectly clear. 
Now, Douglas is best known as a ferocious and relentless spokesman for the abolitionist position. His famous speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, is one of the most astonishing addresses ever given on this nation's soil, not least for the extravagantly dire warnings issued to his audience, the ladies of the Rochester Anti-Slavery Sewing Society, that their fine intentions notwithstanding, they were, by celebrating Independence Day at a time when 14% of all Americans were enslaved, were complicit. And they were headed, all of them, all of them, to a justly hideous demise, which he evoked in great detail. Less often noted, because they are not often reproduced with the text, are those effectively flat but numerous passages where he takes up the subject of textual interpretation, a subject he returned to again and again and again over the years. In these passages, and here's the second of your uh, pages, Douglas speaks, this is after evoking the, the, the horrible end that people were going to come to, he talks about the, the, the proper method for interpreting the Constitution. He speaks of certain rules of interpretation for the proper understanding of all legal instruments. These rules are well established. They are plain common sense rules such as you and I and all of us can understand and apply without having passed years in the study of the law. I hold that every American citizen has a right to form an opinion of the Constitution, to propagate that opinion, to use all honorable means to make his opinion the prevailing one. The Constitution in its words is plain and intelligible is meant for the homebred, unsophisticated understandings of our fellow citizens. I take it, therefore, that it is not presumption in a private citizen to form an opinion of that instrument. Now, the end for, justice, for, for Douglas was justice, but the means was constitutional interpretation in an originalist spirit. Asserting the right to opinion was tantamount to asserting a claim to equality. Now, abolition was the result of a great victory by the Union armies and considerable dexterity by the abolitionists in Congress. But the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were spectacular victories for Douglass's originalist and intentionalist interpretation of the Constitution as a glorious liberty document. Their passage marked a dramatic triumph over other originalist, intentionalist arguments, as, for example, by Chief Justice Roger Taney, who ruled in the Dred Scott case that the founders and framers never thought that African Americans could be citizens. And this is the way it goes. Throughout our history, people have come before the courts trying to persuade the judges or the justices to see the Constitution as they see it, and to recognize that the words of the text contain, like figures in clouds or shapes in the blotches on the wall, protections against this or that form of injustice that they have suffered. Not just slaves, but women, workers' groups, gun rights or abortion advocates, other aggrieved parties have come before the courts to argue for their interpretations, and their occasional success demonstrates how a fixed document can regulate and enable social progress, for good or ill, by allowing people to argue about the meaning of the words of the law. The history of opinion in the United States thus touches on some of the most fundamental issues in American society in history, including freedom of speech, the right to dissent, equality of opportunity, the nature of democratic authority, and the constitution of a civil society based on the free exchange of uncoerced views. But opinion, as de Tocqueville noted, always tends to be mere, unsubstantiated assertion or freewheeling prejudice. If all the positive goods associated with opinion are to be preserved, and if the tropisms towards anarchy and tyranny that de Tocqueville pointed, art, pointed out are to be thwarted, people have to be able to identify and follow what Douglas calls certain rules of interpretation. They have to be taught to respect evidence and sound argumentation so that they can distinguish legitimate from illegitimate inferences and tell a good argument from a bad one. The legitimacy of all of our social deliberation depends on the integrity of opinion and on general interpretive competence. This is why the task of teaching people the rules of the game has not been left to chance, but has been allocated to the educational system, where even people like the destitute Mr. Ramirez learn that their opinions are important, that they must take heed to judge the word or right, and that interpretive competence is the ticket of admission to the American conversation. Now, the history of American education is a multi-layered, often tangled chronicle of experimentation, 
reformist surges, utopian schemes, and the endless confrontation of dreams with reality. We've always expected education to do too much. We've expected it to solve the problems that democracy creates. As Arendt said, it's only in America that education is a political issue. Now, she meant that critically, but my argument is that education is a political issue in a positive sense as well, in that the system of universal, liberal, and general education that crystallized at the end of the Second World War was, for all its flaws and limitations, which I haven't talked about here, but I could, an attempt to realize through education American principles of equal access and equal opportunity that are, in our era of radicalized inequality and weaponized ignorance, have only grown more relevant. Because it was oriented towards citizenship and not towards the professions or the civil service, as it is in other countries, the American system, especially of higher education, that was articulated at mid-century, gave sudden prominence to what it called the humanities, which was then a fairly new category in American academe. The first program in the humanities was in 1930 at Princeton. In the Golden Age model, the humanities were freighted with democratic aspirations, in contrast to science, which had become all tangled up with the defense effort and completely dependent on government contracts, and in contrast to the, the older humanism, uh, a Harvard Center movement that was very uh, 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 elitist and retrograde in many respects. The humanities were advanced as the means to an understanding of cultural history, to be sure, but just as important, in fact, I would argue even more important, the humanities were the disciplines that could foster the interpretive competence that all citizens needed in order to develop and refine the opinions that constituted the most fundamental of their rights. Within the humanities, English was granted primacy not only because it could impart a sense of national tradition and national identity, but also because it was the discipline that most fully embraced the concept of opinion in its purest and most highly developed form, textual interpretation. Now, the story behind this embrace is long and complicated, and I will not uh, uh, sketch it in any detail in the two or three minutes I have remaining. But I'll just begin by saying that the study of literature can take many forms. You can study literary history, you can study genres, you can study the sociology of literature, you can study a history of ideas through literature. Literature is a repository of instances of social situations and so forth. But in the United States, English had become, by mid-20th century, the discipline in which the point of both research and pedagogy was the determination of meaning. It was an interpretive discipline in a way that it is not, in the study of literature, is not in other countries. Uh, this has actually been quite well chronicled, uh, uh, or rather it's well chronicled if you go back and read the materials. Uh, uh, but since not many people have done so, I think that the story I tell will be surprising to a number of people. <clears throat> uh, but around the turn of the 19th and 20th century, a decision was made, you know, emerging here or there and eventually embraced by the Modern Language Association, to devote literary study to criticism, and then within criticism to interpretive criticism. Um, and this decision was affirmed and consolidated by the rise of a powerful school of literary study called the New Criticism, which was entirely focused on the question of meaning. Since meaning is always debatable, it's possible to argue, I do argue it, that an emphasis on meaning is essentially an emphasis on opinion, and a discipline devoted to meaning is devoted to the training and refining of opinion. And so, when the nation called at mid-century for an educational system that would train people to be citizens, English was able to offer itself as the discipline to which the crucial task of disciplining opinion could be entrusted. English was granted a position of general prominence in the American Academy. It was unmatched by any other discipline in any other nation. Many English teachers, it must be noted, were unaware of the reason for their discipline's preeminence and assumed it must have something to do with themselves. If English no longer dominates the intellectual life of the university, in the way it once did, that's not necessarily a cause for regret. Time marches on, things change. But the fundamental challenge remains how in today's world we can create a culture of citizens capable of judging the word aright. To be sure, education always needs to prepare us for the future. But if we give up on the task of disciplining opinion or turn to other tasks presumably more urgent or relevant, then we may be giving up on a certain understanding of societal conversation and individual rights has, I believe, 
served us well in the past. Let me say how happy I am to be here. Uh, thank you to the Franklin Humanities Institute. Uh, thank you to the Amadea family for the, their support of, of this and other events. And thanks, Jeff, for such a scintillating talk. Uh, Jeff and I first met many years ago when our sons were both students together in the same class, in the same homeroom. And I remember our first conversation was about why in the world they were having both of our sons read such a terrible book. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be somewhat less positive than Jeff and try to raise some questions that will make us think a little bit more about the place of the humanities and, and the role of opinion in America. Uh, to do that, I'm going to go way back to her, begin with Herodotus and our, our primate beginnings. Uh, Herodotus is best known to us as the father of history, but it might make more sense to think of him as the father of cultural studies. In his discussion of the Persians, at one point he says, nomos basileus est, which is generally translated as custom is king. Or to put it another way, we are ruled and become the kinds of people we are because we are shaped by the cultural mores or values, values that in many instances are so deeply embedded that they are invisible and practices they support conceived to be natural or unchangeable. This is not surprising given our primate heritage. Uh, we are individuals who live in community with others of our kind and have a place and meaning within that community. In some senses, that place is instinctually determined, uh, but in other respects, it is determined by customs and mores of our particular group. Claude Levi-Strauss demonstrated the enormous variety of such customs in his early 1960s work, The Savage Mind, that details regimes of mores and taboos that characterize almost all primitive uh, hunter and gatherer societies. It would be a mistake, however, to imagine that this was only true of primitive societies of hunter gatherers. When we examine almost all pre-modern societies, we generally discover that they generally think of themselves more as peoples with particular customs than as diverse individuals. If Plato is to be believed, even the most idiosyncratic individual in the ancient world, Socrates, argued that he would not desert his city even when it was going to put him to death unjustly. He knew that he could not do so without ceasing to be the person he was. The idea that human beings are primarily individuals rather than expressions of a people or culture had its origins in the 14th century with the rise of nominalism and found its explicit expression in the thought of Petrarch, who laid out the idea of an extra-political or what we would characterize as a private life. Quote, I have spent all my life to this moment in almost con constant travel. I, begotten in exile, was born in exile. Since that time to the present, I've had no opportunity or only a very rare one to abide anywhere or catch my breath. His experience was an experience that was going to typify modernity. His answer to this problem was the revolutionary notion of individuality that we, after so many years, have come to imagine as central as the central fact of our being. The path to this conclusion was long and winding from Luther and Montaigne to Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, and their successors. The notion that we are ontologically or even just primarily individuals, however, left us with the question of how we should behave with respect to one another. If custom was not king, what then? This was no small problem and was vastly exacerbated by the invention of the printing press that gave Europeans the ability, if not the right, to express and circulate their opinions, their views of what was right and wrong, how we ought to live and not live in ways that led not merely to disagreements, but to wars of extraordinary destruction, waged often in the name of religion. This in turn led to the breakdown of Christendom and the authority of the church, which in many instances was replaced by what Jeff insightfully points to as an individual reading of scripture. The modern world as we understand it was the answer to the anarchy and chaos that this new individualism produced. The enlightenment in the largest sense was an effort to answer this question by establishing a new source of authority to replace the authority of religion and dynastic politics that had been undermined in the previous century. 
This was the authority of reason that was institutionalized in a new notion of science, codes of laws, political institutions, and a new notion of education that drew on a notion of the accumulated wisdom of humanity contained in a set of books that we have come to think of as the canon. The American regime was perhaps the preeminent attempt to institutionalize this regime of reason that allows for individuality and maximizes the possibilities of individual motion while minimizing the chances of collision and disagreement. Based upon self-evident truths and organized in a rational mechanical fashion, the regime was conceived as a way of uniting a diverse group of communities into a single people. Jeff has explained quite persuasively how in the American case this new notion of reason came to be combined with a notion of radical individualism. I particularly like his account of the origins of this notion in the Radical Reformation, although I would want to go a bit further and expand his claim somewhat to include the impact of other dissenting sects, such as the Unitarians and Quakers. Given the emphasis on individualism in the American founding, the real problem at the heart of the American experiment, however, is the problem of aggregating that opinion and forming some sort of community and collective will. In the antebellum period, this was less a problem since the different political cultures of the states and localities were allowed to flourish. David Hackett Fisher has described these regional cultures in his wonderful Albion Sea, which I recommend to everybody. In this period, there was space as well for dissenters from these localist cultures who could always head to the frontier, um, where they could practice what James Scott has called the art of not being governed. The Civil War made it much more difficult, but certainly not impossible to sustain regional differences, especially after emancipation and the incorporation of state law under the Constitution. The closing of the frontier and the nationalization of American culture in the early 20th century and the development of a national media by mid-century completed this process. The diversity of opinion, however, was restrained by the recognition of a common enemy throughout the Cold War. People had their own opinions, but they were more or less united by the perceived common threat. This was augmented by what Jeffrey uh, brilliantly describes as the classical age of the humanities. It rested in my opinion, on several key assumptions. First, that custom is not king. Second, that reason alone is not sufficient to provide consensus because there are different ways of interpreting texts versus the notion, for example, of self-evident truths that we find in Jefferson, who believed that anyone who looked at the matter would come to the same conclusion. Uh, Jeff also sees the answer to the problem of clashing opinions and the development of the humanities, and particularly in English, i.e. Richards and the New Criticism, which provided a way to discipline diverse opinions. Interestingly, and here this is a kind of question I'd have for Jeff, this attempt seems to me quite analogous to the answer the Jesuits gave to the Radical Reformation, which is it's important to read the Bible, but it's important to read it in, in uh, a particular way and using certain interpretive principles. Uh, this parallel offers an interesting topic that I hope we can pursue. One sees many of the same kinds of efforts uh, as the new criticism in the development of the Great Books Program by Mortimer Adler, uh, the attempt to develop a clear and unambiguous language by analytic philosophy, and the notion of an exoteric and esoteric teaching in people like Leo Strauss and others, to mention just a few examples. So I agree entirely with Jeff that this was an... Uh, a, a large-scale effort to bring some sense of how we ought to discipline and understand and aggregate opinion in the 1950s and 60s. <clears throat> this humanistic at this attempt to discipline opinion, however, was broken down for several, it broke down for several reasons. First, 1968 immediately springs to mind, and the birth of identity politics. The rise of deconstruction in philosophy and literary studies also undermined the notion of a canon, the notion of an authoritative reading of texts, and indeed even the notion of the author itself. This was exacerbated, I would argue, by the end of the Cold War, which led to the end of a need for consensus versus common enemy. Um, such a consensus was made even more difficult by the proliferation of cable TV networks with the 24-7 news cycle and obviously the development of the internet. We thus find ourselves 
surprisingly, in a period not unlike that following the invention of the printing press, with the proliferation of individual opinions, but without a guiding structure or institution or practice to bring them together. This leads me to the chief questions I hope Jeff will help us think about. First, how can we discipline opinion today? Is there some interpretive strategy that we can employ that will help us come more easily to agreement? Second, how can we sustain individuality in the midst of a culture that seems to break us down into confessional light groups? Third, how can we find authoritative readings of texts and events when we are constantly surrounded by false rumors and conspiracy theories? This current election cycle is sadly all too clear an example of where we are as a society. Fourth, what can the humanities do to help us reestablish some notion of authority or discipline, especially in view of the fact that in many ways the humanities has been one of the leading forces in breaking down authority and championing, championing, championing diversity. Uh, it seems to me a little like, I want to say Humpty Dumpty or Trumpty Dumpty, but I'll leave it at Humpty Dumpty, has again fallen off of the wall and that the king's horses and men are having a lot of trouble putting all the diverse opinions back together again. This leads me to wonder whether and if so how the humanities can help us reconstruct something like a common world where we can meet to express and discuss our opinions without falling into the rancor that has become all too commonplace. Thank you. I'll say a few words in response to that, but maybe not very many, and then take questions. Um, well, you pose a number of questions that admit of no short answer, and maybe not even of any long answer. Um, like, how can we? You know, uh, it's difficult to know even what the we are uh, that, that might be doing the thing, even if the thing could be identified. Um, but I will say that the the, the, the promise and the vitality of the humanities depends not just on its cultivation of opinion, but on the, the development and refinement of its respect for fact. It's a little known feature of the history of the humanities that uh, at one point, 150 years ago or so, uh, the discipline of philology from which grew the humanities as we uh, now know them was regarded as uh, not only as a science, but as a model for other disciplines that wanted to be a science. Ernst Haeckel, uh, a great biologist of the 19th century, advised his fellow biologists to look at philology, especially the language trees that philologists had constructed showing what languages developed out of uh, what others and where they led to, as models for scientific modeling. That is, as a model for models. He said, without these things, you know, science has no rational understanding of what develops in, in, into what. But philology had already made great inroads. And of course, philology was famous for its extraordinarily precise, microscopic rendering of textual or linguistic detail. That's what made it so boring. That's what ultimately killed it. Uh, but at one time, but at one time, the germ or core kernel discipline of the humanities was noted for its extraordinary respect for fact. Now. <coughs> Literary studies grew directly out of philology, and eventually literary studies became devoted, I, I think productively, and for the reasons I try to describe, to interpreting, interpretation. And uh, this does not suspend fact or displace fact or put fact over here or discredit fact. In fact, it places a certain kind of pressure on fact, especially, and I get into this in my book, and I didn't talk about it much in my talk, the idea of recovering the author's intention which is now very out of fashion. And I say, have to say I hold Duke University responsible for that going out of fashion about, uh, about 20 years ago. But the idea of recovering the author's intention, now thought to be uh, an old-fashioned, un unproductive approach, is, I think, an, an extraordinarily valuable pedagogy and an invaluable kind of common sense approach to reading. What do you get out of a text if you don't kind of imaginatively reconstruct some intention behind the words? There's an argument that says you don't get anything. You know, if words without intention are things are marks that look like words, but they aren't actually words. You have to posit some intention. Uh, and I think that in a democracy, uh, it's incredibly valuable. And I'll draw the connection in a second. It's incredibly valuable uh, 
to have people constantly thinking, what's the intention behind the words? Because this is a way of really apprehending what the other person is trying to get at, or is beyond the words, apprehending what the subjective energy is behind this. I think that's very good as a kind of practice of conversation. I think it's indispensable as a practice of constitutional interpretation. I think it's a great exercise for people if they want to respect each other, to listen not merely to the words that they utter, but to try to get at the energy behind them. And so uh, uh, I'm not saying that literary studies as a professional uh, undertaking should confine itself to trying to recover the intention behind the, the text, but I'm saying as an undergraduate pedagogy, interpreting according, uh, as a matter of getting the intention behind the text, it's, it's matchless and it has, I think, a democratic uh, payout that we cannot afford to minimize. Um, maybe that's all I'll say, right? Uh, I will say one thing, the historian Alan Taylor in the current uh, issue of The American Scholar, uh, talks about um, the, 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 the virtues of an educated voter and the dangers of an uneducated voter. And he said that all the founders thought that democracy would rise or fall based on whether voters were educated or not. And they all had a very large investment in educating the people. And of course, education, uh, by, by education they typically meant some kind of historical understanding, some wide knowledge of different kinds of thinking. But I would say that interpretive competence is a core, is a core skill in a democratic society. And this is what falls to the humanities, and it traditionally has fallen primarily to English, although English has kind of gotten off the boat a little bit. But the, the, the point of Taylor's argument is that we seem to be falling today into a state where uh, interpretive competence is not as general as we would like it to be. I notice in here I'll speak politically that Mr. Trump's base is among the poorly educated. Coincidence? I don't think so. These are people who don't have, primarily, uh, uh, people who don't have that kind of uh, uh, interpretive skill, beginning with respect for fact and proceeding from there on to making accurate observations and reasonable inferences and sound arguments and listening to other people and all these things that many of us take for granted, we don't take them for granted. And uh, <clears throat> I think what we're looking at is uh, a failure of the educational system in this country when we see the rise of a candidate like that who's so unlike anything that we've seen, anything we've seen before. Well, on that polemical note, I'll say. I, yeah. I, I will point out that one PhD in history named Cambridge who pointed out that facts didn't matter. It was how people felt about facts that matter, which seems to me to be exactly the point. He got his PhD from Tulane University, uh, which at one point was a mark of pride, and now it's been, they don't, they don't talk about it anymore uh, at Tulane. Anyhow, I'd be happy to take any, any questions or comments that you had. Uh, is your moment uh, to shine? Yes, Noah. Uh, well, I... I'm going to try and wrap two questions into this. One, I just can't resist because I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what I'm hearing both you and Michael say. And it seems to be you're critical of Trump supporters for lacking interpretive competence, and you're critical of humanities faculty mm -hmm. at places like Duke for having given up on teaching mm -hmm. interpretive competence. Mm -hmm. And there's, you're kind of both toggling back and forth between the two. Um, and I want to press you to uh, be more holistic in your, um, in your response. Because I'm not quite sure if you're saying it's both and. It's either or. They're unrelated. Um, there may be humanities faculty here who wish to take you up on that. Um, and why don't I, I have a question about Frederick Douglass, but I will just wait on that. Okay. But I, I want to, I, I think you guys aren't being as fully candid as you might be, and I want to invite that. Really? Uh, well, I was a little reluctant to make any kind of a political statement and, as an appendix to an academic argument at all, <clears throat> except the, um, the, the, the time seems so glaring that uh, something is called for, and if you, uh, if you didn't say something, you might be accused of evading the issue. I don't think that it's the, uh, the, the, the fault of humanists at places like Duke. 
that we have uh, a political movement like the one that we're seeing today. Uh, <coughs> I think that the. Yeah. To lay fault in a broader way at, the, let's call it universities instead of just humans. So I'm, I'm trying to understand, do these sit side by side? I'm not saying there has to be a causal connection, I'm just trying to understand. You know, one of the developments that seems kind of invisible but alarms me is the fact that in the 1970s, the vast community college system was turned from being an academic uh, system to being a primarily vocational uh, or pre-employment system. It used to be the community colleges educated millions of people, and they actually educated them. I mean, their curriculum was similar to that of a college. I mean, it wasn't, you know, there was a lot of remedial work that colleges didn't have to do, uh, but it was similar. It was similar in form. Uh, uh, but primarily as a response to business interests that wanted to keep the profits privatized, but to uh, spread the costs of job training uh, out of the educational system, uh, the community college system kind of collapsed in the 1970s, or rather it, 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 it bent in the direction of pre-professional or pre-job, pre-employment training. And the educational program in all those Thousands, tens of thousands of institutions uh, shrank, uh, and the, the courses were replaced by other things, life skills courses, and uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't I don't hold Duke or universities at all like Duke uh, are responsible for a general collapse of interpretive competence, uh, but I would say that at a kind of broader social level, there's been less and less support for the idea of training people in the. Uh, uh, and the art of opinioning, uh, opinionating. Um, uh, my uh, comment about Duke was almost a joke, except that Duke was uh, a tremendous example in the 1980s of a university that lifted itself up, and I saw this from afar, uh, lifted itself up from an excellent regional university into a university of national uh, preeminence when the then provost discovered that he could uh, uh, hire an English department for much less money than it would cost to hire a physics department or a chemistry department, and these people would be very noisy, and they'd be, uh, attract a lot of attention, and Duke could become a kind of national powerhouse, beginning with this field. And so we hired a lot of people who were pushing very, very trendy and fashionable. These were powerful minds. I respected a lot of them. I knew, knew many of them personally. Th these, are, these are powerful minds. I wouldn't uh, denigrate their accomplishment at all. But uh, part of their power was their kind of exploratory pushing of the boundaries away from an old-fashioned interpretive criticism and into new styles of criticism that, you know, that were more productive for them at the time. And uh, the example of Duke and places like Duke was that they, you know, in, in with the new and out with the old, and uh, the, the the emphasis on interpretive competence and 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 interpretive understanding was was uh, diminished and other things came to the fore. Now, this didn't affect the character of democracy in the country, but I think that in a broader, more generalized sense, the, uh, the, the respect for opinion and the respect for debate responsibly conducted uh, diminished for you know, many, many reasons, uh, and that we've suffered the consequences and we're still suffering them. Maybe we haven't even really begun to suffer them. We'll find out. Let me just say a couple words about that. Uh, first, I, I and I'll talk about Stanley Fish, who is an old friend of mine. Stanley once described himself as the world's greatest rhetorical gymnast. And I think rhetoric as to, the transformation and abandonment of fact in favor of rhetoric, I think, is, is, has been a problem at universities. And I, I heartily want to support Jeff's view. I don't think it was universal to the humanities, but I think it certainly was a powerful strain within the humanities. And I think it, it, has, a, it has an understandable beginning in 1968 with uh, the hegemony of a particular way of looking at the world that was called into question in 68 that, that delegated women, blacks, and minorities to, to disadvantageous positions. So I think that the, the behind it was a social program that was sensible, especially when we were a hegemonic power, I think it's become much more difficult now for us when we live in a, a, 
competitive world. So I'd say that's that's one part of it. The second part of it is the decline in the number of students graduating from high school in the United States. We used to lead the world in the number of high school graduates. Almost all the European states now have a higher rate of graduation from high school than we do. So it isn't just, and community colleges, I agree with Jeff, has become vocational. But also, if you look at our university, the decline in humanities, and not just at our university, but almost at all universities, has been relatively universal. Now, part of that has to do with the influx of, of foreign students who are much more interested in the sciences and engineering and STEM disciplines. A lot of it has to do with the emphasis upon STEM in our high school system today. We see that I run the AB Duke program for merit scholars. We see immensely gifted students who have all been attracted to already work in laboratories in high school and are going to go into science rather than into the humanities. And part of it has to do with just the changing economic climate. So our students when they ask them, when, when you ask them what they want to do, if they don't want to be a doctor, uh, they want to study uh, uh, engineering or public policy because they think that's the quickest way to the job. Now that's not so surprising, and it's driven in part by parents and by the, the levels to which our tuition have reached. So it's not surprising to me that students take that, that route, but I think this is another reason why we ought to re not give up on requirements for students getting a liberal education as opposed to getting a more vocational and technical education. I mean, the, the growth of markets and management, the growth of people that are interested in more practical disciplines seems to me to be a real threat to exactly the kind of thing Jeff's talking about. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I I'd like to um, return to the question of intentionality. It seems to me that you're talking about opinion as um, a kind of thinking that is interpretive, but that has a kind of transparent and unified intentionality, and that that really did get sort of dissolved in, um, in the humanities, beginning uh, with post-structuralism and deconstruction. And it was much more about learning about the unconscious, about the play of difference, about structures in which intentionality was uh, was a foil. It was it was the straw the straw man, and uh, and so if you look at cognitive philosophy or cognitive psychology and the paradigms of theory of mind or folk psychology, they place an enormous interest in understanding the intentionality of others for evolutionary reasons, you know, that if you are, for example, you know, a, a primate who, um, you know, might be attacked by, by a hunting animal, you have to be able to read their mind through any number of, of signs. And so intentionality does seem to me that something that we don't mine anymore in the humanities in ways that we could and that we should, that, that it is um, just as interesting as the ways that we don't know ourselves, as the ways that we uh, want to have a stable and, and you know, uh, communicable position um, on, on different things. So, so I do, I, I, I like the idea of a return to the author's intentionality um, as one of the ways that we can understand the text, as long as we don't understand the author's intentionality as governing all of the meanings that come out of a text. Uh, because clearly the reader's different meanings, different um, deconstructive forces are also, also really important. So I just wondered if you right. could speak to uh, that. Uh, thanks for asking that question. I would never say that literary studies as, an, as a profession has to restrict itself to the attempt to recover the author's intention. I only said that the, that attempt has resonance way beyond the literary text, that a skill, an interest, a respect for that kind of work has resonance way beyond any academic pursuit. Uh, let me tell you what, a, what, what, what that value is. Um, in the area of constitutional interpretation, you have the text, and that text is evidence of textuality, of, of intentionality. So when you're looking at the text, you're looking at hard evidence, but hard evidence of what? The intentionality can never actually be determined. 
First of all, you don't know whose intentionality you're dealing with because the text is multiply authored. You don't even know whose intention, uh, intentionality you should be dealing with because the framers themselves didn't think that their intentions counted for anything. Um, James Madison said that the, the authority came from the people you know, who ratified it in their various state conventions. We'll never know who those people were. <laughs> we'll never know what kind of motives they brought. So you're looking at a combination of things. Hard evidence of intentionality, but at the same time, a bottomless well. You'll never get to the, to the bottom of that well to figure out what the intentionality actually is beyond debate, which means that while you're always looking at something precise, clear, specific, lucid, you're always in the area of speculation as well. This means that the conversation will always continue. Right? In other words, we'll never get to the point of hard, clear truth where we say, well, that's it, now we know. But it will always be trying to do that. And that's the basis on which I think a democratic society moves forward. Respect for fact, respect for the mind of the other, but an agreement that the conversation will never end. I mean, the, the, you know, this is why intentionality, I think, is such a valuable trait to have, because this is what keeps the conversation going. If, you, or if you're a member of the Supreme Court and you're asked to discover a right to privacy in the Constitution, well, it takes some ingenuity to do that. You know, but, but it's not impossible. If you're on the Supreme Court and, you, and, and, and uh, you're asked to discover a warrant for the Civil Rights uh, and the Voting Rights Act, it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's not that difficult. It's not impossible. Or if you're asked to discover some warrant for un, unregulated gun ownership so that I can own a semi-automatic semi weapon if I want to, as the Supreme Court has proven, it, it might be hard, but it's not impossible. And so for good or ill, this is the way it goes. You know, you're dealing with hard, the hard evidence of the text, but you're in the area of speculation so that the, the processes of debate constitute the the mechanism of social progress. Yeah. If I could just say one merger yeah. that supports Jeff, having written a book or edited a book called Ratifying the Constitution, when you actually look at those ratifying debates, uh, that, that you, you, you can learn some intentions from some people, especially North Carolina, where there's very good, very, very well maintained debates. But you also discover things like the fact that it was ratified unanimously in Georgia had to do with the fact that almost all the Georgia people in the ratified convention had some claim to Western land that they wanted to have guaranteed by the federal government so they could sell it and make a fortune. Uh, or the people in Delaware ratified unanimously because they were called by the Philadelphia Papers the lower provinces of Pennsylvania. Uh, so there, so I agree with you. It really leads, when you look at it, you, you, you learn a great deal, but you also learn that, that there's no fixed answer to the question. And can never be a fixed answer to the question. I mean, even if you had one author you, know, you could never ask the author, what did you really mean? Who, who of us can say what they really meant? Have you ever had the experience of saying something and then a week later and saying, what was I thinking? Or the experience of saying something and then having somebody say an improved version of it back and say, yes, that's it, that's what I was thinking. You know, who of us can, can determine with any assurance even what we mean at any given moment? Uh, and yet, that's what you want. You, know, you want the intention behind the words. Or, or even worse, having the students repeat to you what you said, thinking, oh my God. Yes, word for word. That's right. Yes. Then it means that they didn't understand anything. <laughs> Great. Well, let's thank Jeff. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.